Welcome in to the Ots and Audibles podcast. Matt Prem, Eric Scopel on the show. And today on this Thursday edition of the podcast, we're bringing in Jeff Hansen of Cougar Sports Insider, our BYU affiliate on the 24-7 Sports Network to get you connected, to get you in the know for this weekend's top 25 matchup between the Cougars and the Oregon Ducks. Jeff, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Yeah, appreciate you guys hopping me on. You, you guys don't know this, but I am frequently checking your site to be like, "Hey, how do I run a website?" You guys are <laughs> you guys are the pinnacle, man. So appreciate you guys letting me uh, on. Hey, wow. your your check is in the mail. Your check is in the mail. <laughs> I was gonna say, wow, really, really opening up great for us. Like, I feel <laughs> the kindest thing anyone said about us in a long time. We'll take it. Uh, let's go right into this uh, before we. Before we go to the game, though, um, BYU's off to a hot start. They're two and zero. They knocked off a top ten team in Baylor. They're almost in the top ten. Um, they had a really good year last season. Just what were the expectations coming into this season? Um, what was the talk of what this year could be like? And has that Baylor pro has that Baylor win maybe? amplified those expectations and maybe drawn more interest to where we could see a really big crowd of BYU contingent here in Eugene. I mean, I'm already kind of expecting one before that win, but now I feel like if, if there were people who were on the fence and they could get a ticket, still, they're going to do it. Yeah. I, I think, I mean, in terms of expectations, BYU's expectations are always sky high. I mean, uh, nobody thinks BYU is going to run the table more than BYU fans do. But but this year they they said that with with kind of a seriousness. I mean, it's basically the same team that was in Provo last year. Pretty well everybody came back. And so last year was kind of the surprising year. I think after 2020, BYU lost so much talent to the NFL. You lose a guy like Zach Wilson. That was 2021 was supposed to be the rebuilding year to set up a, a, a 2022 schedule that has some opportunities on it and a senior laden class. People felt pretty good about 22. The fact that 21 was so good, uh, it was really just kind of uh, icing on the cake for BYU fans that really kind of gave us this platform that we've seen in Provo that, hey, BYU is going to take it to a completely different level. So uh, in terms of how fans are reacting in, in Provo, I mean, there's obvious excitement. Top 10 wins don't happen every day. But there's also a, a feeling of kind of satisfaction that, hey, yeah, we we finally have arrived and we knew we were going to get here. Um, so it's it's kind of interesting. It's a little bit of excitement because uh, you can't help but be excited. But also uh, it, it's two games into the season, right? The, it could all be unfolded this week against Oregon and uh, that everybody's determined to not let that happen. Jeff, I just wanted to talk again before we get into this matchup more just about kind of this run here because. BYU's won 23 of 27 games since 2020. That's just really impressive at face value. Not a lot of teams in the country. Actually, I wish I would have done the research. And you might know even how many teams have a record like that over the last two-plus seasons. It's probably Georgia, maybe Alabama, maybe Ohio State, those kind of programs you're talking about. So that puts this program in kind of rarefied air right now. I guess, where does this rank among maybe the best year or two run in program history? And then just kind of throwing Kalani Sataki's name in there. Was he kind of elevated himself up the list of of the best to coach at the school yet, or, or is there still enough in front of him where you kind of need to? Because it's really been the last two and a half years for him where he's really cemented it. Before that, some up and down times. Yeah, I mean, so in terms of the best run, I, I there's some older fans than me that are going to yell at me for saying something like this, but uh, 1983 to 1985, like BYU won a national championship. They had Heisman contenders and Steve Young and Jim McMahon and Robbie Bosco. So they, they, they had a pretty good run then. That was like 40 years ago, and college football was just different. And, and so, I don't know, is that three-year run better than where BYU is now? I think there's probably an argument there. What, what's made this three-year run, I guess two and change, so unique, I think, from a BYU fan perspective is just kind of the, the stuff surrounding what has happened on the football field. Uh, obviously 2020, like nobody even knew if football was going to be played, especially at BYU where, where their schedule completely imploded and they didn't have a conference schedule to fall back on. Right. Football was, was totally up in the air until like three days before they kicked off against Navy. I mean, it was, it was very firmly in question. And so for the season to even happen was pretty awesome. And then for it to play out the way that it did was, was great. And then last year, uh, BYU goes six and one against power five teams. That has never happened. I mean, as good as BYU has been 
nationally over like 40, you know, 30, 40 years of football, they've never had that kind of run against teams that are that well respected across the country. So that's pretty unique for, from a BYU fan perspective. And now going into the Big 12 conference that, you know, obviously it's not the Big 12 of old, but it's not the Big 12 or it's not the the Mountain West or the WAC where, where BYU has been, right? So it's, it's kind of an exciting, I, I think this is the three most exciting years of, to be a BYU football fan because of all of that other stuff. There, there's probably a debate in terms of best. It really just comes down to how you define that. But, but I think this has been the most exciting three years for sure. And, and then your second question, Eric, about Kalani, what's kind of wild about BYU is, is really, with the exception of like a three-year stint with Gary Croton, You've really only got Lavelle Edwards, Bronco Mendenhall, and now Kalani to, to really even compare. There hasn't been that many football coaches at BYU uh, since they've been BYU. There was there was BYU pre Lavelle, but but nobody talks about that. We just we just don't acknowledge that it existed. Uh, so in terms of you know where BYU is or where Kalani stacks up with those other two, uh, certainly not Lavelle. You know Lavelle had that staying power for 30 years and and really put BYU on the map. But I think there's a very very good case to make that Kalani. Uh, especially if he finishes this year off strong, uh, absolutely should be talked about with the same respect that Bronco Mendenhall is. To Jeff, to kind of stay on that last question here for a second, uh, I we first one to say I'm not the most versed in BYU history, but I do remember the first couple of years of Kalani Sataki's career as head coach were rocky. Um, he had the good start, the nine and four season, but then they had like one of the worst starts in program history and they finished the year four and nine, and then a couple seven and six seasons. So well, I don't know if necessarily he was on like the chopping block or ever coaching for his job, but it did feel like from an outsider's perspective, there was some uneasiness as, Hey, is this going to work? And then he has 50 career wins going into this game. And in the last two seasons and two games, he has won virtually almost half of those games. Um, he's gone nine and four, four and nine, seven and six, seven and six, and then took a huge jump to 11 and one, 10 and three. They're two and oh, they've got a top 10 win this season. That's a big difference. What happened? Like, how, how did this team go from just middle of the road to now 10, 11 wins, 10 wins, top 10 win? Yeah, BYU, BYU is a funny program, right? Because of missions and the number of missionaries mm-hmm. that BYU signs in each and every class. The, you know, typically if you think of a a coaching cycle, right, it takes two or three years for a coach to get his guys in and on the roster. Well, add two or three years to that. And that's kind of BYU cycle. Kalani's first recruiting class that signed in that 2000, really the 2017 class, right? The 2017, he got some of his guys. 2018 was his first full class uh, of, of having that full year long recruiting cycle. Some of those guys are just barely like redshirt freshmen this year. I mean, so BYU, because of that, that missionary stuff where it's, it's at least half, usually a little bit more than half. Usually if they sign a full 25 person class, about 15 of those guys end up going straight on missions. Uh, due to the nature of how they have to manage their roster, I think everybody inside of Provo recognize that it's going to be rocky for a little bit just because BYU's different. Uh, and, and at the time, you know, 2016, 2017, the transfer portal, I think it was just starting to exist. Mm-hmm. It certainly wasn't yeah. the bonanza that it is now. Kids still had to sit out a year. There wasn't that immediate eligibility. So recruiting was really the only way to, like that traditional recruiting class out of high school was the best way to retool your roster. And at the time, that just was going to take a long time to do. Um, so I think what we're starting to see now, like who knows if BYU can expect double digit win seasons, you know, every year perennially, perennially until Kalani leaves. But I think you're starting to finally get the players that Kalani has recruited all the way back in 2018 and 2019. They're now finally in the program, they're freshmen, and they're starting to make a difference. So this is honestly, I mean, it really is kind of the last two or three years are like the first years that you could start to judge is Kalani going to work for those first two or three years. He's, he's just rolling with what was left over from the program uh, that, that Bronco Mendenhall left. Speaking of one of – you talked about the transfer portal and its kind of availability and, and how it's impacted things. And I think BYU's benefited a little bit from it. I, I do a story every week before the opponent, the top highest you – know, 10 highest rated recruits on the opposing roster. And I, I believe two of the – I think the top two on BYU's roster are transfers. And 
uh, Kingsley Siomataia and Puka Nakua, both from Pac-12 schools. And I want to ask you specifically about Kingsley because those listening to this show, Oregon fans, know that name well because it was a year ago that Matt and I were saying he's going to come in and start at left tackle and he's going to blow everybody's minds. And then, shoot, by the time October – like Halloween rolled around, I think he was transferred, and by the time the early part of November hit, he was uh, he committed back to BYU, his home state. What can you kind of tell us from what you've heard about maybe maybe kind of why he ended up at BYU? And and, and I know we, we talked about a little bit off air, but like kind of why did he leave Oregon to begin with, or kind of what did you hear from that regard? And then just how has he kind of set, settled himself in? Because I know he's starting this year as at right tackle, at least has the first two games. Yeah, Kingsley. So we've known Kingsley here locally in Utah since I think he was in eighth grade is when BYU offered him. I mean, so he's been on the recruiting radar for for years. And when and so we were able to form a pretty good relationship with him and with his family. And, and to a lot of people, it kind of surprised us that he left the state. He was just always so family oriented and, and being close to home and being close to the people who were familiar with him was always super important. And I, I think that uh, going out to Oregon, there was kind of a built-in support system, for lack of a better word, with the Sewell brothers were up there at the time. Uh, but, you know, they had played high school ball together, uh, uh, Noah and, and Kingsley. So I think a lot of people thought, hey, there's there's an aspect of home there. So, so he's going to be comfortable. He's going to be okay. It, it didn't take long for him to get out to Oregon and, and then just realize, hey, he wanted to come back home. What, what's been fascinating as I've talked with Kingsley and with, you know, those around Kingsley since he's returned, since he really, since he hit the portal, uh, normally when you, you get those big time transfers, you're able to kind of glean, as I'm sure you guys have uh, experienced in the past, there's the story and then there's kind of like the little tidbits in between the story that you kind of figure out like, oh, they were unhappy because of X, Y, and Z, you know, such and such coach said something. There's been none of that with Kingsley. He absolutely loved his time in Oregon. And I think Oregon checked every box except for one, and that was the family. And he wanted to be close to home. Hmm. It, it's been really kind of the most boring transfer story to follow because, yeah, he transferred home to be close to family, and that's it. In, in terms of how he's playing, yeah, he's going to start at right tackle this week. Uh, he, he's played really, really well. Uh, kind of unfair, I think, for him a little bit, but but the nature of being a five-star uh, he was compared to Penny Sewell. Like he's been compared to Penny since he was in eighth grade. I mean, they, they, those two knew each other growing up. They looked similar. They were same size. They, you know, they're very similar uh, prospects. Uh, Kingsley's always been a little bit more raw than Penny. Penny was able to step in and, and he just kind of had it figured out. Kingsley absolutely can get to those Penny levels, but he's he's got to work a little bit harder on the technique where Penny just kind of naturally had it. Um, so probably unfair expectations for Kingsley when he stepped into the Oregon program, not to anybody's fault, but, uh, now he's at BYU. He's had a year at the college level. He's kind of assimilated himself and you're starting to see the, the results of that on the field. We're going to take a quick, a uh, quick break here as we continue our conversation with Cougar sports insiders, Jeff Hansen. All right. Welcome back to the Austin audibles podcast, Jeff. Um, this BYU team, I, I I looked at their game against Baylor. I watched parts of it from the press box at Autzen as we were wrapping up our coverage and then um, got home and was able to watch some of that as well uh, on the DVR. You look at their depth chart, um, it confirms what my, ins- my, my eyes told me is this is a big team. They are physical. They... Certainly, I didn't have this idea going in, but they certainly kind of put to bed the idea that independents not named Notre Dame uh, don't have big players, don't have good depth. Uh, they are they are not like a UMass. Uh, they are not a, like you said, a Mountain West Conference team. This is why the Big 12, I think, had their sights on them. They've, they are very big. Dan Landing this week said they've got NFL players across the board uh, on their roster. Just from your perspective, where are those guys? Who are those guys? Who who has NFL scouts kind of going out to Provo for home games or, in this case, out to Eugene this weekend? I'm sure there's going to be a lot because this is a huge opportunity for those guys to showcase their talents um, against the seventh best talented roster in the country in Oregon. Uh, huge opportunity individually and huge opportunity for, for BYU as well. Uh, yeah, for sure. It, it starts with the offensive line. Uh, Blake Freeland at left tackle, depending on what service or who you look at, he's he's been uh, talked about as maybe the top one or two tackles in next year's draft and then as low as five or six. But certainly 
among those that's talked about in a day one, day two type of a pick. Uh, and then right next to him at left guard is Clark Barrington, who was a preseason All-American at a lot of publications. So those two, the left side, uh, the left side of the offensive line, absolutely bona fide NFL talent and, and kind of interesting stories that uh, Barrington came from nowhere, you know, out of Spokane, Washington, small little high school. Uh, he was kind of an afterthought, uh, it, you know, and I, I've been pretty candid about this, but he signed with BYU. I hated the offer. It just felt like a waste <laughs> of a scholarship. And, and he turned out to start on day one as soon as he got home from his mission. And he's been a you know three, four year starter now. He's, he's fantastic. Blake Freeland was a quarterback in high school and, and BYU's coaching staff saw him and immediately saw offensive tackle, which really kind of blows my mind because when he committed, he was playing quarterback. And I remember scouting that next game and being like, what in the world is happening here? This kid is clearly not a quarterback. What is happening? Uh, but he's turned out to be, he's 6'8", he's 315 pounds. I mean, he's a big dude at left tackle. He can play. Uh, and then, you know, Puka Nakua, I, I think you kind of mentioned him earlier as a transfer. He, he's an obvious NFL talent. Uh, Kingsley could get there like we, we talked about earlier. On the defensive side of the ball, it really starts with the linebackers, I think. There's, there's three or four linebackers. Who I, are they ever going to be first round draft picks? Probably not. But there's three or four linebackers that absolutely have the talent to get a chance in the league and, and make a run of it. Uh, you'll hear names like uh, like Max Tooley. Uh, he was a former four-star recruit. He, he was really good out of high school. He's just been around forever after he went on a mission, came back. Now he's a senior. Uh, they talk about him the same way they talked about Fred Warner in Provo. And Fred Warner, it worked out. Max Tooley gets that same kind of notoriety, has that same kind of impact. Uh, Keenan Peely, I've always kind of said Keenan Peely's like a poor man's Noah Sewell. He's not quite as big and he's not kind of uh, quite as fast, but the way he plays the game and the way that the defense kind of revolves around Keenan Peely will probably look pretty familiar to most Oregon fans, knowing what I know about Noah. Uh, so those linebackers are all really good as well. That, and then Jaron Hall. Jaron Hall is, I, I think, in my opinion, he's maybe a little small. Maybe he's, maybe his injury history comes back to bite him. But Jaron Hall plays like a Sunday quarterback to me. Uh, we'll, we'll see what, what happens. Quarterbacks, you know, the most difficult NFL position to, to, to gauge and evaluate. But I, I see NFL potential. I see a lot of the same things that uh, Zach Wilson showed when he was in Provo just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I want to stay on the Jar Jaron Hall topic because, you know, it's, it's an interesting story, as a lot of these BYU players are in terms of you mentioned the mission part. And this, this kid, I was looking at his profile. He, he committed to BYU in 2014, eight yeah. years ago. Signed in 2016, went on a mission, sat behind Zach Wilson for a while, played a little bit, and actually played pretty well. It looked like, I think it was back in, you can correct me, 18 or 19 when correct. Wilson had an injury. Um, kind of what's been the maturation process there? And, and I imagine you talked earlier about kind of 2021 was seen as maybe a rebuild year, but it wasn't. And I'm guessing a part of that was the quarterback play might have been better or maybe maybe expedited from what it was expected to be because of how well Jaron played. So. Kind of what, what can you tell me about him? And and I've watched him play quite a bit. It looks like a player who can can do all sorts of things over the field. Like Oregon's players have a lot of respect and have kind of communicated that this week. But kind of give us the Jaron Hall story. Yeah, uh, yeah. So he committed forever ago. Yeah, 2014. <laughs> he he's a he's a BYU guy. His dad played at BYU. His brothers. He's got a younger brother on the team now. He had an older brother who played when he first got to BYU. So this is just a BYU family. Always has been. Uh, so as soon as he got an offer, he pounced on it. And yeah, it's been <laughs> nearly a decade since that happened. Uh, in, in terms of how he is as a quarterback, people don't believe me when I say this, but 2019, BYU opened up a true quarterback competition. It was Zach Wilson going into his sophomore year and Jaron Hall coming off of a red, red shirt freshman year. The competition was close. Like it was really, really close that coaches went into fall camp not knowing which one they were going to start. It wasn't until a couple of weeks into fall camp that Zach was finally named the starter, and it, it could have easily just as gone the other way. The, the big difference in, in that decision was that Jaron Hall was also playing baseball uh, for BYU at the time, so Zach had dedicated more time to the film room while Jaron was playing baseball, so they felt that Zach was mentally a step or two further than Jaron was in, in terms of how to read a defense. That was it. If Jaron was playing football, he maybe beats out Zach Wilson and, and maybe the Jets have a different quarterback right now. That's how close that competition was. Um, so in terms of what we've seen from Jaron, a lot of it is is was kind of expected for most people inside the program. The biggest difference in Jaron last year and this year is his health. He did miss a couple of games with a rib injury last year. 
But up until last year, he had never completed a full game. Uh, he, I think he had made two or three starts and he had exited with a concussion in two of them and then some other undisclosed injury in the third. Uh, and so nobody really knew what to expect. Could he take a hit? Could he last a full season? Uh, he had kind of that freak rib injury, so he didn't get quite the full season, but I think he played 10 or 11 games last year. Uh, and he's been healthy so far this year. That that really has been the the biggest difference. And then I guess he did step away from the baseball diamond and go all in on football, and that that's turned out well too. When when you look at this team for this matchup against Oregon, um, is there an X factor that that you feel like could make or break this game? Or maybe the better question, since football is such a, a team dependent sport, um, is there a position group that really needs to to perform well, or if they don't perform well, it's bad news for, for BYU. Yeah, for me, it's the BYU defensive line. Last week against Baylor, they they played incredibly well. I think I think Baylor ran the ball 52 times at a 2.9 yard per carry clip. I mean, so they just couldn't get anything going with the ball. And people have asked and said, why was Baylor so insistent on running the game? Well, well Baylor's offensive coordinator was at BYU for, for three years, Jeff Grimes. He knows this BYU defensive line, and so do a lot of BYU fans. And over the last few years, even when the deep defensive line has played well, eventually it felt like every game they had that breakdown and let a couple of long drives and just couldn't couldn't stop the running game. And if you look at even just box score stats over the last two or three years, the rush defense has not been good. Uh, there was a lot of optimism that it would change this year. You really don't get a test against USF, but it certainly looked different against Baylor. The question is going to be, is that, you know, a sign of the times that, hey, things really have changed or was that kind of a one off? Uh, and I think we're going to find out against Oregon because Oregon, this isn't Chip Kelly's Oregon. This is a physical Oregon team. And I don't think a lot of BYU fans really are prepared for the physicality that Oregon has on both sides of the ball, frankly. Uh, but but Oregon's going to want to run the ball. They're, they're going to run it differently than Baylor did. But Oregon's going to want to control that line of scrimmage as well. They're going to want to run the ball and get to the edges. Uh, how BYU's defensive line responds, in my opinion, is what makes or breaks this game. I think another thing for me here that's it, pretty pivotal is, is what's going on with some injuries for, for the Cougars. We talked before the podcast started, and you kind of explained that maybe Kalani is a little similar to Dan Landing in terms of being pretty tight-lipped with some injury news. So um, some of this will be speculative, but both Puka Naku and Gunnar Romney, last year's top two receivers, both guys that are really highly regarded. In fact, I mentioned earlier on the show, I do that top 10 recruits on the team thing. And Naku was second. I think Romney was fourth. Um, so these are these are some of the quote unquote like blue blood, big time recruits that are on this team. Both those guys missed the most previous game with Baylor. Uh, Gunner hasn't, I, from my understanding, hasn't played all year. And Puka hurt his ankle against South Florida. Um, what's the, I guess kind of what's the latest or what do you know on those two and, and what what's kind of the likelihood both play? And then I guess just to kind of add on to that, Give us a little bit of Chase Roberts because Roberts is a guy who stepped in um, against Baylor. Two freshmen, hadn't really produced obviously much because he's second game of his career and he goes out and eight catches, 122 yards and a touchdown. And, and I think really was somebody that to me jumped out because we talked about Jaron Hall and, and, and kind of what he's able to do. He needs targets that are reliable and it really just seemed like he gravitated to Roberts from what I, my perspective most of the game. Yeah, no, I, I think you're you're spot on there. We'll we'll talk injuries real quick. Um, yeah, you're you're right. Kalani Sataki, he doesn't, you know, I, I always tell people, and people are always asking, as I'm sure they are, you guys, hey, what's the latest on so and so? And and Kalani could come out and say straight up, hey, he's gonna play, or no, he's not gonna play. And I wouldn't believe it until I saw kickoff. They, they're just like so tight lipped with injuries in Provo. Uh so from what we know, it, it sounds like Puka's injury, it's an ankle injury. And it really is kind of up to him and his pain tolerance. It doesn't sound like it's going to get worse. Uh, and, and so he's going to be a game time decision. What that means, I think, in my head is really, Puka, go try it out on Saturday morning. If it hurts too bad, then you're out. If it doesn't, then you're in. But it really isn't a medical clearance or anything at this point. It's a it's a pain tolerance thing with Puka. Um, with Gunner, BYU's never said anything specifically on what the injury is, other than it's a non-football injury. And uh, so some sleuths on the internet who have followed his mom on Instagram, she posted a picture of him after surgery, um, I guess like a kidney surgery or something. And so whether that was caused by football, whether it was outside of football, nobody really knows for sure. Uh, from what we've been able to kind of gather from people around the program is it sounds like if, you know, if it were you or me and it was, we, we had the same surgery, we're back at work. We're just fine. 
but you and me aren't having to get hit in a football game, right? So whatever they did to his kidneys, is he able to take a hit or does he like, are there real ramifications, right? Beyond just a football injury of, of, of him getting hit. And so uh, that's not something that your typical sports science or physical trainer is really equipped to make that decision on. So I think BYU is just being ultra cautious in how they bring Gunnar Romney back, working with non-football doctors, right, to really kind of evaluate that risk. Um, whether they play or not, Chase Roberts has proved, yeah, that, that he absolutely is capable of being a big part of that receiving offense. Uh, he was an Under Armour All-American out of out of high school. Uh, he's one of those BYU guys that commits and goes on a mission, and then everybody kind of forgets who he is until he comes back. And it's been two or three years since he since he was in high school. Um, but in terms of what he did on the field, not surprising. He was a big time player. He played at American Fork High School that ran an offensive system very similar to BYU's. So when he got to Provo, it kind of made sense that hey, he's going to be able to figure this out pretty quickly. The only question with Chase was going to be how how quickly can he shake off that mission rust from not playing football for a couple of years? Is he going to get into game shape quick or what does he look like? Uh, I think he kind of passed that test against Baylor. He certainly looks like he's in game shape. Going back to maybe the maybe it's the defensive line for you, but is there other weak are there any other weaknesses that you feel like this team has or I don't know if weakness is like the right word to use here, but matchups. Are there are there matchups that you're you're excited to see play out? Um, you know, for me, I'm really curious to see how Oregon's offensive line, which is dealing with injuries at guard um, at both spots, their regular starter got hurt against Georgia in the first half, didn't play in the second half, didn't play against Eastern Washington. He's expected to play against BYU, but he's coming off an injury. that you, That's still notable. And then their other starting guard doesn't look like he's going to play uh, in this game. And so it's going to be a different player at that spot. And and for me, I, I, I'm fascinated to see how the changes, interchanges at, at the offensive line plays out between BYU's front seven defensive line, seeing how they stymied that Baylor offense, which is pretty darn good. Um, is there something like that on your end that you're going in thinking, hey, I think these guys are good, or maybe it's I don't know how they're going to handle this. Is there a matchup you're really excited to see? Yeah, I, I'm with you, Matt, on the defensive line. I think that is going to be really interesting, and I, I, I think it really is rooted in how physical Oregon's offensive line is. Um, BYU fans aren't prepared for that. I think the BYU fans, when they think of Oregon football, they still think of 10 years ago. It's, it's a different team. So that's, that's going to be interesting to see for all of the reasons that you just described. I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated to see how that plays out. Uh, beyond that for me, also BYU secondary. Uh, I mean, while it isn't Chip Kelly's organ, it's a different organ. There's still a ton of speed for, for yeah. on, like top to bottom on that Oregon roster. BYU feels good about their secondary. There's, there's some questions at, at strong safety, but at corner and at free safety, they feel pretty good. They, they, they've said that this is maybe the best secondary they've had in the last 10, 12 years in Provo. Uh, but that's that's not a very high bar to clear. So we're we're really going to see them, I think, be tested against Oregon. Um, so how how that secondary keeps up with the speed, how they defend those those quick athletic wide receivers, and, and how they respond to Bo Nix, right? I mean, Bo Nix, I think probably I, I don't want to speak for you guys, but I would imagine Oregon fans are just as excited to see who is Bo Nix really. Uh, after two games, nobody really knows. You can't make any any sort of determination after two games, especially two games that couldn't be on, on further ends of the spectrum in an FCS team in Georgia. Uh, so who is Bo Nix? He's certainly talented, certainly can do a lot of things with the football. And you, you put him against a, a, a secondary that is kind of an unknown as well. It, it will be fascinating to see how that plays out. I've done a couple of radio hits this week, Jeff, and been asked about Bo Nix. I'm kind of like, I, I, I don't really know either. Cause it's like against Georgia, you know, not that they were going to win that game. Even if he played like an A plus game, I think Georgia was just significantly more talented. And frankly, not a lot of teams in the country contend, but he made two mistakes that totally altered the way that first half played. And then you get in a big hole and you change the game plan and it just becomes a certain kind of game. And, and Bo's kind of owned up to that. And then he turns around against Eastern FCS competition, like you said, and was was statistically one of the best games an Oregon quarterback has had in about eight to 10 years. He completed 85% of his passes through five touchdowns, no picks, all of those things, which are great. Only played the first drive of the, sec of the second half um, and, and still had 277 yards. So all these things are great. But like, like you said, I think we're kind of going in like, we're going to learn a lot about 
who Bo Nix is. So I, I'm with you there. I'm sure um, Oregon fans feel that way, and I'm sure BYU fans probably do too because it's, it's, it is kind of the ultimate mystery of what is Oregon's quarterback situation actually going to look like because I think the two opponents the first two games are really impossible to compare. And BYU is obviously closer to Georgia than Eastern Washington, but where does Bo Nix fit in kind of that uh, highs and lows as well? So, And then my, my last one here for you, Jeff, before we let you go, thanks for being so generous with your time. Um, give me give me some keys to the game for BYU. Give me three things that the Cougars need to do on Saturday to ensure they stay unbeaten and they leave Otson with the win. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we talked about the trenches already. That That's where BYU kind of uh, butters their bread. They, they pride themselves on being bigger, stronger, faster than just about everybody that they play. Whether that's true or not, you know, that's that's ultimately the test week in and week out, but that's what BYU strives to do. So both both offense and a defensive line, that's, that's, there's going to be a ton of questions that are answered there. Um, and I guess kind of coinciding with that is the running game. That BYU, frankly, got lucky against Baylor to – to leave Lavelle Edwards Stadium with a win while only rushing for, I think it was like 83, 87 yards. It, it was it was less than 100. And it was, I think, it had like a two and a half yard per carry clip. It just was not a threat all game long. Most of those yards came from Jared Hall making plays happen that were broken down pass plays. BYU just could not run the run the ball with their running backs at all. Uh, that that Baylor defensive line is among the best in the country. They're, they're big, they're, they're strong. So... Was 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 that really a testament to how good Baylor is, or was that more of a whoa? There's there's some real problems with this BYU rushing attack. Uh, we just don't know yet. I don't think BYU can go into Autzen, one of the craziest places to play in the country. I don't think they can go to Oregon and leave with a win, only rushing for 83 yards. That that has to be a threat. Uh, and then the last thing, like we kind of just talked about, is is Bo Nix. I think that. Um, Bo Nix is maybe in my, from my eyes as, as an outsider looking in on this game, he's the biggest unknown. He, he might be great. He might be elite even. He might not be. Uh, so if I'm BYU, I, I'm going to gamble and, and try to make him beat you, right? And, and if he's elite and he beats you, you tip your cap at the end of the day and hey, Bo Nix, good on you. You won. But I, I wouldn't want, if I was BYU, I wouldn't want to get back on the plane, flying back to Provo and going, ah, I still don't know if Bo Nix is very good because we got beat in all these other areas. So so making Bo Nix put the ball in his hands and making him make you know quick decisions, making him throw the ball accurately, that that's where I would uh, where, where I would put my emphasis if I was you know coordinating BYU's defense this week. I got one more question for you, Jeff. Um, what how how important is this game to the season? Like, I, I feel like from an Oregon perspective, the outcome of this one will help shape the narrative of 2022 for Oregon. Like, if they win, then everything is still kind of on the table. Obviously, if they lose, they can still win the Pac-12 championship and get to the Rose Bowl. But if they win this game, it's a it, it kind of puts them back where they were at the start of the year in the rankings. It, it opens the door for a New Year's Six Bowl game should they not win the Pac-12 conference, uh, it will provide that jolt that the program had before the destruction of Georgia. Um, what's it like for BYU's side? Is a lot of the season's success hangs with this outcome, or are there other big games down the stretch for, for BYU where they look at this and say, we'd love to win it, but it's not our season? Yeah, I think that the, 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 the latter there is probably the way to describe it. it it's one of those that... If BYU goes on the road to Oregon and beats a ranked Oregon team, uh, that helps define a season. But if they go on the road and they lose to a ranked Oregon team, I don't think anybody's going to blame BYU for for losing this right. game. So I, I don't know that it, it – right. And I, I, so I don't know that this is uh, that big of a game in terms of like, hey, the season – like the success of the season hinges upon the result of this game. But having said that, independence is funny, right? I mean, it really is. You're, you're gunning yeah. for – you're gunning for a New Year's Six bid, and as soon as BYU gets one loss, they're pretty well out of contention. As much as you know, fans will try to like come up with crazy scenarios where a one-loss BYU can still get an at-large bid or something like that. Realistically, they can't. So in that sense, uh, if that's really the end goal, then the BYU has to win every game and every game. To, you know, until there's one loss on the schedule, every game defines what the season's outlook will end up being. Uh, it's it's after that where things start to get really dicey, right? After BYU drops a game, how do you stay motivated for for that next game when when really the difference between two losses or three losses really doesn't make that big of a deal? Um, but but I, I guess in more 
micro from a micro perspective, I, I'm certain that that Oregon doesn't look mm -hmm. at BYU as a recruiting threat. But BYU absolutely looks at Oregon as a recruiting threat. I mean, Oregon's right. had success here in the state of Utah, right? Guys like Jackson Powers Light, his I think his family, somebody, his grandpa maybe was a an old BYU swim coach. Like they were BYU fans growing up forever. And and he immediately left the state when when Oregon offered. It was pretty quick. Uh, Harry Taggart from from Corner Canyon High School is another one, the Sewell brothers. So BYU has lost guys that that maybe they weren't number two on these recruits lists, but certainly guys that they would have loved to get into their program somehow. That uh, that Oregon's been able to come into Utah and and snag you know one or two it feels like every year. Uh, so from a recruiting perspective, I'm I'm sure BYU would love to have that feather in their cap to say, hey, look, don't be so quick to jump to Oregon. We're good too, right? But uh, you know, does one game matter? Who knows? But they they absolutely right. would like to have that that argument. Well, Jeff, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, we really appreciate your time, uh, your expertise. Uh, and are you coming to Eugene, or uh, will, will we will we seeing you in the press box? I, I had planned on it. We've had some family medical stuff this week that's come up that uh, we'll find out on Friday if I if my wife lets me get on the plane or not. We'll find out. Well, hopefully that gets you know. Hopefully your emergency gets good. That's that's the most important thing. So good luck there, and maybe we'll see you in Austin. Uh, but if we don't, enjoy the game. Enjoy the rest of the season. Thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. No problem.